Okay, welcome back to our uh, second lecture for, for today as we've been looking at uh, crucifying the flesh. The last hour we looked at how we can lay the axe to the root for root of uh, lust and um, pride. Um, and before we just move into, um, you know, how is it that we can get rid of this? I think we just have uh, just a couple more of um, uh, thoughts to to bring up before we we complete that. Um, uh, any any questions up until now, or can I just move into this last part and then we'll uh, we we'll, we'll look at how we can get away and get rid of these evil desires and lusts. So if not, I'll just move in. Okay, um, so just to bring about a quick note about what happens or what are the consequences of of the lust that there may be there are many consequences that comes when we engage in lust. One is uh, that uh, uh, the lust lust in itself um, uh, is going to minimize or choke the effect of God's word in our lives. Um, as we have seen in uh, um, Mark 4.19, Jesus says, The cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires of other things uh, um, will choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So the, the word of God uh, that, that you receive will not produce fruit when lust is engaged in when there are other things in uh, of the world that continues to take precedence and that chokes the word and that brings about negates what the word should be doing in you okay the lust lust also uh, makes us lose our freedom and we become enslaved to the things that we are lusting after and uh, we become slaves to to that to you know slaves to the thing that we are we are lusting after lust also brings a destruction like we said when uh, abstaining from fleshly lust was against the soul it causes damage it uh, it hurts uh, the soul when you indulge in things that uh, are fleshly and that are lustful it takes on your mind, it takes on your concentration, your will, uh, the inability to, to do anything. It becomes destructive, not just to the body, but also to the mind, that uh, the, the faculties, the very faculties that you need for your daily functioning becomes affected. So these are some things that I thought, you know, we should just have also an understanding. Now, what do we do to... Um, uh, to break free or what do we do to get rid of these works uh, of the flesh and uh, the fruit of the flesh. Um, and I'd like to just take your attention to two scripture passages. And uh, if we could take some time to just uh, read it and then we will, we will go through that. And uh, probably I'll ask uh, two people to read from there. Um, let's look at Galatians uh, chapter 5 verses 16 to 18 and then uh, from 22 to 25 Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 to 18 and then 22 to 25 so would someone kindly unmute and read um, from Galatians 5 16 um, walking in the spirit 16 I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Uh, from 20 till, ma'am? 22 to 25. 23. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are crisis have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. 
Okay, thank you, Samuel. Would someone also read Romans chapter 8, verses 8 to 13? Romans 8, 8 to 13. Romans chapter 8, verse 8 to 13 says, So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Thank you. Thank you, Abni. Thank you, Samuel. Okay, so when we're looking at these two, um, uh, these two uh, references, uh, it is very clear to see that there are the flesh and the Spirit of God. They are not in unison together. When you are in the flesh, you're not in the spirit. When you are in the spirit, you are in the flesh, right? And it, these these uh, verses come about very uh, strongly as we look at it. So a way, one thing to do when, in order to ensure that we uh, keep away from the works or the fruit of the flesh is only when we live in the spirit, when we abide, when we walk, when we live in the spirit. And these, um, what we read, the references we read, teach us how to do that so that the fruit of the flesh is something that is eliminated from us, especially as believers. And we have in place the presence of the spirit, which when we continue to live and walk in the spirit, we do see that the fruit of the Spirit becomes manifest in us. Who Christ is and the life of Christ, the power of Christ becomes, um, uh, becomes operational in us. And that's what we see in, in our lives. So when we live in the Spirit, we are living in what, what He gave us uh, when we are born again. That is the new creation. We, and when we are the new creation, we are born of the Spirit and everything becomes of Him. So when we, when, now that becomes, uh, you know, a truth. But we need to be able to walk in that truth. When we claim that we live in the Spirit, we also need to walk in the truth. As we saw in Galatians 5.25, it says, if we live in the Spirit, then let us also walk in the Spirit. The word walk is to mean to stand in line with or to march towards or going in the same way or keeping the same step as as okay or walking in line. Like like for example, you know, when if you remember in kindergarten when you learn to 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 walk in a straight line, they will draw, the teacher draws a line and you're supposed to walk in that. It's like that. To be able to walk in this in the spirit is to keep alongside with whatever the Holy Spirit desires of us. It is to chart everything, our lives, our thoughts, our passions, our desires, our will, all in step with the Holy Spirit. So walking in the Spirit happens only when you live in communion with, with, uh, with God in every area or in every realm of our life, whether uh, it is something that we say, it's what we do, it is what we think, it is what we desire, it is what we envision, e everything. It is to be able to uh, walk in alignment with 
God. And, and the more that we abide, the more that we stand in relating in, in our relationship with God, we keep ourselves open to walking in step with the Holy Spirit. Okay. So as we, as again, you know, just bringing back that word, uh, the verse in Galatians 5, 16 to 17, it says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So like we said, there are two opposing things here. There is your fleshly lust and there is, there is uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. So while your flesh wants to do things that are absolutely contrary to what the, to what, uh, the, uh, the Holy Spirit wants, when we choose to live in union with the Spirit, we do not yield to the sinful desires of the flesh. Okay, so as verse 17 says, you can see those opposites. They are contrary for the fleshly lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And there are, they, these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. So walking in the spirit keeps you away from the lust of the flesh. You cannot have two feet at two different boats. You can't be having your foot in the flesh and your foot in the spirit at the same time. Either you're here or either you're there. Okay. So, and what is it we are called to do? It is to be led by the power of, of, the, of the Holy Spirit. And we see that in verse 18, it says, if we are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So the reason that we don't engage in things of the flesh is not because of the law, but because of our relationship with God, because we are led to walk in the power of that of, of the Holy Spirit. We stand in, um, uh, you know, it focuses on how the Spirit of God um, gives those of us who are in Christ the power to, to live a life in the spirit and it is it is done in love so when it, so um what what paul is revealing here that it is um possible for people who are in christ to allow the holy spirit to lead us to win uh, you know that battle over our selfishness and our sinful desires and when we act in the spirit's power we act uh, we are in, in the way crisis. So we do not, uh, like for example, when we act in the Spirit's power to love others, we, we, we do as Christ loves us. When we do love others in that way, we have no need of the law. None of its rules and regulations matter because our words, our actions, our thoughts are born out of our relationship or out of our love for God and and uh, that's what that that's what the verse is meant to meant to mean that when we are we're not under the law because we don't feel we are to keep the law but we are led by walking in union with the spirit of God the more that we we walk in his spirit the more we do things that are of the law we do things out of our love for God and and all those desires or all those things become purified and that that becomes in line with what God wants us to do. So to be led by the spirit is also to walk in the spirit, which means that we live in one with the spirit. We live in union with the spirit to do all that he wants us and all that he births in us. And that's, that's the power that he gives us. So when we walk in that spirit, what happens? The fruit is produced. Uh, so as we if you look at those verses from uh, 19 to 21 it talks of, of all the work of the flesh so when you when you engage in the work of the flesh those are the fruit of the flesh which we did see uh, last week uh, but when we walk in the spirit when we when we live by the spirit when we are led by the spirit we produce the fruit of the spirit and what is that we see that in galatians 5 22 25 it's love joy peace uh, patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control okay and it says those who are christ have crucified the flesh 
with its passions and desires and if we live in the spirit so we also walk in the spirit so the more that we are in step with the spirit living according to his power the 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 fruit that comes out is only that of the spirit so if we if you remember last week we did talk about the seeds you know it depends on what seeds you are sowing in and what what is the root that takes that establishes itself so when you continue to stand and walk in the spirit the seeds that are sown inside of you is that of the spirit and there that's what bears fruit so if you walk in the um, spirit you are not fulfilling all those passion or those selfish passions or those desires because it is the holy spirit and his power that will help that will empower us to bring down all the passions and the desires so um you know think of it this way i know th this may not be as effective an example but uh think of of you being in um, maybe when you are in like let's say you're watching a a, a, a movie a, a good movie let's say a mystery movie when you're watching in it your mind is there you know it is it's all there it's so in encaptured by what you are seeing or what you know what you're experiencing that there is no other place for any other thoughts or um uh, or 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 things to do at that point on you want to complete that entire movie before you can move on so walking in the spirit is something that completely encapsulates and empowers you so that you crucify the things of the flesh okay and that doesn't it it ceases to be important it ceases to take a hold when you are walking and when you are being led in the spirit and um, uh, you see that you know the same uh, truth of all of this is what you see in romans 8 what we read romans 8 to 13 that it says those who are in the flesh cannot please god those um, but when you are in the spirit the spirit is the one who dwells in you and if anyone is not in the spirit you are not his okay so this the it it talks very um strongly and it and brings about the truth very strongly that when you walk in the spirit that's what brings um the power of god in your life however when we walk in the flesh it separates us from god it brings us to to a place of separation from god so as believers we are to recognize that we that when we when we don't live in the spirit we are living in the flesh so for a believer um when we are walking in the spirit it's it's like the body is dead because it, um, being in in flesh will lead you to uh, to sin okay but when we walk in the spirit there is where we have life and where we have peace so verse 13 it brings about how that if you live according to the flesh you will die so living according to the flesh not only leads to a separation but it also leads to spiritual death and that's what is being referred here you know spiritual spiritual death where a so even if a believer who is saved by god with christ in him and the spirit dwelling in him if there is continuously a place of living according to the flesh eventually you're moving away from the power of the holy spirit and you journey into that spiritual death at some point of time okay so to be able to uh, uh to um uh, this this can be done only with the help of the holy spirit again it says uh, verse 13 it says but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live so when you walk in the spirit you're bringing uh, a, a um an end to these practices of your body of the flesh and you are you are moving into eternal spiritual life so it is the holy spirit that can empower us to put to death to get rid of these sinful deeds of our body so crucifying when we when we are um coming to play a place of crucifying our flesh 
it is something that that really requires an active place of ours of um, and and we we call it something like amputation where you are absolutely cutting off or you are breaking or you are um chopping off everything that causes you to sin like in it said in Matthew 5 29 to 30 if it is your right eye that causes you to sin pluck it out and cast it from you so you are cutting off every source uh, and everything that causes you to sin because you know scripture says it's profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body being cast into hell so if there needs to be an absolute cutting off and this doesn't mean like a literal cutting off but you know it could be let's say for those uh, for for people who who uh, who there is an addiction to alcohol it is maybe keeping away from company that that uh, uh, makes you drink or keeping away from a set of friendships that bring you to a place of of sin or um, uh, maybe keeping away from the phone or keeping away from using uh, you know technology in private um, and keeping somebody accountable to it so there are many things that can 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 be uh, painful can be cumbersome but uh, we see that the that, that the Holy Spirit promises to empower us to help us to deal with our weaknesses okay so walking in the spirit is the most important thing to get rid of our fleshly lusts and to keep our souls from going into brokenness and going into a place of bondage and a stronghold so moving keeping with the spirit uh, walking with the Spirit, being led by the Holy Spirit, is what keeps us away from our fleshly desires. Okay. Um, uh, in addition, a couple more of things is to be able to being rooted in Him, to being established in the person of Jesus Christ. Colossians two six to seven. It says, "As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him." rooted and built in him and established in the faith as you have been taught abounding in it with thanksgiving so when you when you talk about being rooted being established it is to really put your faith and all of that you have deep within uh, i don't know if you all have you know when you when you go to the beach and uh, if you don't want the waves to pull you down you actually you know kind of root your feet into the sand so much so that you have a pile of sand that is that's got your foot stuck in it so even if the waves are um, you know kind of strong and you're at the shore you don't get pushed as easily so you know just a picture like that to know that you need to have your root in him being established it is to uh, it is to get a firm grounding a firm foundation a firm strength a stability in god so you what you're doing is you are planting more of yourself in jesus and and not in something else not in a church or not in in a uh, you know in a denomination not in a not in a ministry or not in any kind of a doctrine but on the person of jesus christ everything that you are learning and and understanding comes because of you firmly rooting yourself uh, on him and and you will see that in uh, you know as, as the um, uh, uh, the in Matthew it talks about the wise man and the foolish man how they build their house on sand right uh, the foolish man builds it on sand and the wise man builds it on the rock the more foundational or, or the most strong your foundation is uh, you understand that you will not be wavered and tempted by things of the world the more that and and i think practically when we look at this how do we practically apply this is um uh, I'm, I'm sure all of us have faced this you know in a day when we have not been able to spend enough of time in the word and in a time of prayer those days often sometimes to be the ones that become a lot more tricky it becomes very very shaky 
Uh, and so when something happens, uh, you know, it's easier to fall than when it is when you have had your time and, uh, you know, your, your, your good establishing in him so to being to being able to do that or, or let's look at even even you know as um uh, as families when when there is a rooting in god and in his word no matter what the storm is or whatever the issues are the families as a whole are able to stand strong because of the foundations being strong right but for those maybe families who aren't who've, who've got it on very slippery ground are often kind of kind of break away so it is so what it says is how do you break out of it is one way is to be able to establish yourself in jesus establish yourself in the work and in what he has done and not on anything that comes as a uh, you know, as 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 adds add-ons like like a church or a denomination or or anything any specific uh, teaching or doctrine that comes in. Another way to severe uh, to to cut off uh, this uh, uh, the sinful uh, habits is to cut off any kind of influences, ungodly influences, and Scripture is talks about that of how company can corrupt you can corrupt bad habits and uh, how our uh, the way that we choose our relationships needs to be right and uh, it it is that 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 we are careful about who we attach to you know I, i'm not sure who said it um, you know show me your friends and i will tell you who you are i'm not sure who who said that um, but uh, you know that's that's absolutely true that uh, who we hang around with, who we tend to build our um, our affections with, really can influence the way that we uh, we live and and the way that we have our passions also going. So being careful about who we choose and uh, what we choose and what kind of a community or a society or a or or uh, friendships we choose. Now that does not mean you know you shouldn't have friends who aren't believers but um you your love for god your love for god should grow stronger even in the midst of being in the world because the world in itself is like your it's your mission field and you've got to be there and and even even you know jesus said you know uh, while they are in the world uh, pray for the the presence of the Holy Spirit there. So yes, we are there. We do we do have associates and acquaintances who are um, who who may not know the world, but being careful that we are not in the world. Um, I'm sorry, we 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 do not work off the world, even though we are in the world. Okay, so being able to severe and cut off any kind of influences that uh, that could put us back in a place of uh, uh, harm or or bring us back to a place of having these selfish desires. And lastly, is to keep ourselves consecrated, to keep ourselves from a place of holiness and uh, keeping away from anything that leads us into sin, and to removing anything that causes us to sin. Um, and dealing with that with absolute uh, firmness and severity. So we looked at how we can um, get rid of these fleshly desires. One we said is if we walk in the spirit um, and we are being led by the spirit. The second we said is to um, uh, is to be able to be rooted in Christ in the person of Jesus Christ. The third we spoke about was to cut away all kinds of ungodly influences and the fourth is to remain consecrated to remain holy um, by by keeping ourselves in in um, you know uh, meditating renewed by the word of god as well as uh, being led by the presence of the holy spirit okay uh, i'm i'm done today and i just want to open this for any questions or any observations or any thoughts that you would have? Yes, Samuel, please go ahead. 
um, so, so I think um, so. Pastor, when does um, a passion or or a good thing um, become lust like? Um, I'm reminded of this. There's this phrase uh, that keeps repeating. Uh, it's uh, "be obsessed or be average." So there's there's this. Uh, I think it's someone dal dal Someone wrote this book, but it's it's about. Uh, it speaks to you know if you want to excel at something, whether it's uh, music or some sports or or even writing or anything, uh, you know, uh, you need, I mean, uh, and, and people who generally are very good at something uh, have kind of been obsessed with that thing, whether it's, you know, playing a guitar or, or mastering yoga or anything. So, so as, as believers, um, you know, um, when we live in the world, definitely, you know, things sometimes speak to our interest. Some of us, you know, it could be gymming, bodybuilding. Some of us could be a music instrument, uh, sports, um, and uh, and you just get pulled into it. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, you know, you, you, like uh, if you are being pulled towards pornography or alcohol, you know, like that, that there are very big red flags. And so chances of getting into that is, I think, um, not getting into that is bigger, like, because, you know, you're, you know, you're, the Bible, the word of God doesn't allow that. But in other engagements, you want to excel at work, uh, or some of us get drawn towards technology. Um, and we just end up spending hours and hours researching, talking about that. Uh, and it, it almost becomes like an alternate identity, you know, like, okay, so Sam, you know, Excel. So he's like, you know, he, he just loves Excel sheets. And every time you speak to him, sooner or later, he'll bring up a topic about Excel sheets. And he's just, so something like that, it becomes like, so, so, so it, it's, it's like your passion, your interest kind of occupies your mind to a great extent. This, so is that a borderline love? Maybe, you know, you, you spend, say, an hour or two uh, reading Word of God and um, praying um, and your spiritual walk, um, you know, is, is okay. I mean, I, I don't know, it's good, but it's, it's there. But at the same time, uh, because of your obsession with this other thing, you're spending like, you know, maybe five hours, six hours a day. Some of us, it could even be our families, kids. So, so something which seems healthy, uh, but could it be a lust in disguise? I think that's my question. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, as, even as you were talking, I was looking at the example of healthy eating. Even, uh, uh, you know, the, the way that uh, it turns... Uh, every meal like turns into something that is made healthily. So there's so much of focus and time and concentration that's put into preparing something that is healthy. Um, okay, so uh, I, I think some of the distinguishing features, one is um, how much... Uh, a, a, the 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 i think one of the things i'd like to bring about is the intent the motivation behind the passion so yes it is to eat healthy which is a good thing but does it consume you in everything that you do let's say conversations with other people um the dinner table conversations you know, kitchen routines, um, even does it does it take on largely things, uh, even maybe your workspace? What has, what is it, what, not just the motivation, but what drives this? How much does it get, uh, what is it that's driving the need to do this, I think is, is something that we need to determine. Like we said, these are very, probably quite subtle in itself, but if there is uh, if there is a inclination to knowing that you can work out a, a meal prep um, 
all by yourself because you have done A, B, C, D, E, F, G things and not being thankful for the fact that, you know, God's provided it. And that if it moves into that, the inclination moving into, into this is something that is all left up to me to do. That only if I take these efforts and study this for the next five, six hours or, you know, uh, make mistakes in these meal preparations or in, in whatever, what, whatever the issue may be, then it tends to become an idol. Let's say, like you said, bodybuilding. If every activity in the day is geared towards, towards that, that means it's occupied a large part of your mind. It's brought about that desire to, to look good or desire to eat well uh, or desire to, you know, to ensure that um, others also catch on to the, to the goal or to the, to the aim of eating healthy or, or bodybuilding. So, so what does it, how does it occupy your mind? And if that's all that is, if there is a large portion of things that occupy your mind rather than God and the things of God, then I would call that uh, a fleshly passion, something that you are so passionate about that it's become like a, a fleshly motive or a fleshly purpose that keeps you away from actually fulfilling maybe the purpose of God. And I would say that even in with things like, let's say, ministry, right? the focus becomes on, on enhancing a specific ministry and doing the best way to work it. Or, or let's say even maybe a church, you know, the, the church should, uh, how is it that we can bring people so much so that the focus is lost on, on the person of Jesus and your relationship with him. So anything that takes away that, if that limelight leaves uh, Jesus, and his work and what he can do in you move to something that you should be driving in order to get things going, then I think that that becomes very clearly a, a fleshly desire or a fleshly passion. It becomes your own agenda. That becomes your own agenda. And if there isn't an alignment with what God's purpose and agenda is for you, and you're taking too much of time onto something else that may not even be a plan and purpose for you, for that God would want you to pursue, but something that's coming out of your own hobby or your own interest or something that you desire to do, then that that definitely takes on it. You've placed yourself at the throne room, right? And not what God would desire of you. So then I would say, yes, that's what becomes uh, a fleshly desire. Again, uh, if, if you know and, and and I believe that, you know, there are times that the, that the Spirit of God will nudge and will prompt us in our spirits to show us how much is too much. You know, even when you're watching something, uh, you know, maybe Netflix or something, too much of it, the Spirit of God will nudge and prompt you, you know, I, that's enough. You know, move on to something else or move on to, uh, you know, getting your work done or, or spending time with me there will be the nudge that comes in. But when you ignore that nudge, ignore the prompting of the Holy Spirit is when you begin to see that you are desiring something within, something that you do is interesting and good for you, that, uh, that you feel is good for you, that you continue to engage in. And I think those are pretty fine lines in itself. But I'd say these are some of the distinguishing factors that are there. Mm -hmm. Um, it's helpful, Pastor. So I'm um, taking away one is intent. Mm -hmm. uh, what intent uh, is causing the drive? Um, and then um, God being the focal point, you know, God being present in the throne uh, and not something else. Um, and and uh, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, like ignoring that, uh, consciously ignoring that. I think these are really helpful pointers. Um, I, I, I did have another question, which is, I think, uh, the opposite, uh, which um, is, you know, you want to, so in, in your effort to overcome the world, the flesh, uh, you know, you move to the other extreme, borderline self-flagellation, where, you know, you, know, you want to, like, 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 you know, be, you just, 
it's all Beat about yourself up. Mm. yeah uh, you you don't want to you know you go for unreasonable amount of fasting to you know spending time like everything else is is not even a priority like it's not even a second priority so, so where the the focal the intent is still you know you want to know god personally and experience him and uh, and, and you might call it traveling and and things like that you know but but your intent everything is in place um would would that be a danger of uh, i don't know but i even feels weird to say last but you know <laughs> but mm-hmm. where it's it's so much so that you you're almost like a hermit now um, Mm, so uh, so okay so uh, i don't know if i'm going to be able to be able to well answer that but that becomes more again works without without faith right you uh, i i think that would be that you intend that all your fasting all your praying all your um all the right things that you are doing is something that brings you closer to your relationship with god so it it focuses more on works and that's where there needs to be a balance you're just not the hearer but you're supposed to be a doer you need to be both and so i'm wondering if that borders on into that when again the reliance will be a dependence is a lot more on what you do in order to build your relationship with god and not just the freedom of receiving uh in faith all that god has graciously given us so i'm wondering if that moves into that and it becomes a lot again it it becomes i don't i don't know it may not be lasting i'm not sure if that's that's the right word to use but it becomes definitely a focus on on self driving something of yourself to attain that relationship whereas you know we know that by grace it has already been given to us we just walk in the freedom of doing it and not being so um held by the by the by the the works of it and that also i would say i i mean i'm i'm supposing would be some is sin in itself that that we rely a lot on just the works mm-hmm. um, yeah i think that's the best way i can answer it if anyone else has a Thank has you. a uh you know insight or thoughts on it to be great uh, harrison i think you've raised your hand is there is it uh, to share what you what you think um i have a question okay yeah um I heard you saying some few things in a way God you know can tell you, you know, to take a pause you know, and pay attention to me. Okay, do you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can. I can. Okay. Um the question I want to ask now is it possible for God to like um you know tell someone to take a pause maybe in business or maybe in studies and just pay attention to him in a sense that okay you just um, like you know let go of everything or maybe let go of business or something like that you know to just you know focus on him completely because for me right you know let me just say for my kind of person i feel like okay i want to walk or maybe possibly do a business while i do ministry mm-hmm. but you know giving my whole time you know maybe paying attention fully to ministry you know for me is something that you know a bit um well I say uncomfortable for me because one is that I don't want to like you know start dwelling you know on people you know to take care of my family or whatever it could be but rather I want to see how I can um um like you know maybe work or possibly do a business while I'm also doing ministry because mm-hmm. i've seen cases you know where you know most in you know, the ministers or most pastors you know will end up you know maybe like you know focusing so much on giving and paying this or paying that you know just to see that um they have something in their pocket 
Mm. And for me, it's more like, you know, we now drive the attention, you know, we now move the focus, you know, from the main course, you know, to our own um, individual um, target or individual uh, pursuit. So for me right now, I want to find out, is it, um, is this something that God, you know, will permit, you know, to permit or say, okay, I want you to take a pause on all these things and pay attention, you know, to me completely. Because when I look mm-hmm. at the case of Paul, Paul was still having a business yeah. and while still doing ministry. And right. I can remember that even at the, at the end part of his ministry, he said, if there's anything I've taken from anyone forcefully or mm-hmm. have you know, done this or have done that, you know, please, you know, you tell me so that I can refund or return it back to you. Mm-hmm. So in this, in this aspect now, I want to know if it is something that maybe as a pastor, as a minister, evangelist, or a teacher, that, you know, we let go of everything that we are doing or business or work and just face ministry completely. Thank you. Mm. So um, I don't, uh, I'm, I may not think that there is a general answer to that question. However, it is something that is very specific to each of us as individuals and to what God has called each one of us to do. Um, so there is there are certain giftings that God has put in each of our lives and in each of our hearts and uh, uh, how we and it is important that we use these giftings or these talents that he's given us for his glory and for things that will extend his kingdom. And yes, there is also um, ministry that may come. Now, when you can define ministry two ways, where you see your your very workplace, wherever that may be, maybe your maybe your business, um, your uh, a school, a hospital, um, uh, an an institution, or any any place that you are in is also a place that you are called to be a minister. Uh, and also, of course, ministering to a body of believers or running a church. So, so this is how, you know, I'm just broadly classifying it for our understanding. Uh, so there is a general purpose that God has for each one of us is to, is to be a minister of God, to be able to bring people to Christ, to live uh, a life that is holy and, and uh Uh, acceptable in his sight. Now, that's something that we are all called to do. We are called to make disciples. Um, Now, does that mean everybody moves out to work in only in ministry? Uh, No. And that's where the specific call of God comes, that uh, with the talents, with the skill that God has put you in or at the place that he's put you in, he wants you to minister to that environment or that that milieu that you are in. And that, again, is something I think is a very specific call. Uh, so I, I personally, you know, to maybe just to personally share my own story, um, I knew from, from many years that God has called me to be an encourager of, of people, um, and especially through, you know, through counseling. However, there are other gifts that God has put in my heart, maybe um, one of being a teacher, one of uh, one of um, of being a um, you know a, a teacher of the word also. Uh, however, so so now looking at the kind of roles that I play, I I know deep within my heart, and something that you know that keeps getting confirmed every day is that God has called me to encourage and be with people in pain. Um, and that's what, uh, so would, would, uh, th- does God want me to be a minister? Yes, he would, he wants me to be a minister to, to both people, those who may be believers in, in running a church, but also to those who are outside. So if I were to look at it, my influence has been larger among a non-believing community than it is to a believing community because of the kind of work that I do outside of a ministry setting. I, I also minister to people outside of, of the Christian faith. So I, I personally think that it is a specific calling 
to each one and what God wants you to do at that point of time. So, and there may be seasons in your, um, in your, in your life also that God would want you to focus on, on something that is specific. Like I remember when I was a young mother, I was very clear that I did not want to take up anything uh, seriously with, with either with ministry or, or, you know, working, working outside because I knew that my, it was that season where I had to be there for my children uh, in their growing up, in, in building them in establishing them uh, as, uh, you know, s spiritually as well as as individuals. So that those initial years was something that I was very clear um, that I felt God led me into not getting into something that was like a full time. But then as they grew, uh, you know, God brought about another season where I moved from from that that place of being a stay uh, the, uh, uh, a stay in mom a home home maker to working out you know partly into ministry partly into into doing out, outside that uh, outside the skill that God has given me so I think it's it's something that um, Harrison that you know you would need to seek God to find out what is His plan and His will and His purpose for you um, and it may not be fitting to give you an answer saying that yes you know if that is what it is you you should do it and that, that that's how it should it should be like like you said so rightly when you look at scripture the best example we have is about paul where he was a tent maker yet there was there was also something that he was doing parallel and that's something that uh, you know, God had called him to do. However, you you may have um, you know other, other people. I'm, I'm trying to think of others in in Scripture that I'm not able to bring out any other example where they were completely ministering and they were not part of a, a part of a. I, I think probably Timothy, but I'm not too sure again. But uh, th these are specific plans and purposes that God will reveal to you as you seek Him. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Harrison. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll close. Um, we're way up above time. Let's close with a word of prayer. May I request someone to please close in prayer? Mangi, would you please um, pray? Um, it'll be if you could close with a word of prayer. Mangi, if you're there. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know our hearts, Lord. You know challenges and, you know, things that hinder us, Lord, to fulfill your work, Lord. The mandate that you've given us, Lord, on this planet. We pray, Father, that you, you will work in us, Lord. You, you will root out any roots that's any root of evil, Lord, any root of, of lust, any root of uh, envy, any root of uh, any ungodly desire, Lord. Father, we pray just that you sanctify us, Lord. We leave ourselves in your hand, Lord. Do with us as you please, Lord. Lead us where you want us to go and let us only walk in your way, Lord. Because we know that you go before us and you never lead us where you don't go, where you don't want us to go, Lord. And you not you not let us do what you don't us you don't want us to do, Jesus. We thank you, Father. We pray, Father, that you be with us, Lord. And let your Holy Spirit, Lord, continue work in us, Jesus. In your mighty name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Mangi. Thank you, everybody. We'll meet again next week. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.